Yeah, let's kick it off. Um, first of all, maybe a few words. So as you can see, I'm also with Robert Bosch, GmbH, that's my main work employer, but I'm using the slide set of the Linux Foundation Europe. I'm advisory board member there and basically ended up there due to the, all the work in automotive, open source, and better, which I did. And to give you a rough idea, what we will cover today is first of all, open source in a commercial environment, most likely all of you are somehow in a commercial environment and in open source, you know some challenges in there, but I always like to get a more general picture on this. And then also go over um, to consider like the usage of open source and not directly on the mobility industry, but more like the things which you are operating in, which you need to be, take care of and then go on with really the challenges and opportunities, what's going on, what do we see with the wider consortia, connectivity, chances, China. And I may mix sometimes mobility and automotive because, well, Bosch was so huge in combustion engines that we just basically had the automotive world. But now we see due to electrification, more things, more ecosystems grow together. So sometimes I will say mobility, sometimes automotive. Um, yeah, we basically also just move on to say mobility, mobility more often and no longer automotive because we also see the stacks grow together. I personally, I am in this field of automotive since more than 15 years, always with Bosch or subsidiaries of it and like 12 years with open source. And what I found quite impressive recently, so I went to Brussels for FOSTEM and before there were workshops from the European Commission, there were workshops from the Open Policy Summit and then one number which you could see also there was like 65 to 95 billion euros are spent in the open source world contributing to the uh, GDP and I put this out of this report the impact of open source software. The link is below. The slides, I guess, will most likely be shared later or also make them public. And it's like a 200 pages of what all innovation means and technology, open source software as well as hardware for Europe to come to digital autonomy, other fields. And I just thought the number is already enough to just tell. And yeah, why does it come that we have, like, we're building products and we have open source in? And there are typical elements if you are a project manager. I was project manager for, like, six or seven years, and I typically need to operate in three environments. So I had a time, a schedule which I had in, I had budget, and I need to deliver a certain amount of content. And these are limited resources. And so you typically can consider what are my chances where I go in this triangle, how do I get a faster development, how I can I reduce budget, how to do not develop all on your own, and then there is someone saying, you know, I found this thing in the internet, and that's maybe the start for open source, which leaves you just in this one way, because even if you say, well, I'm not convinced it's something new, what all risks are in there, let's go with it, just hire another hundred engineers, you will not find them, or just throw a whole lot of money in another company, you don't have the money, so you always end up in there and just may see open source is your way into faster development, cost savings, you get more flexibility because you can change things more easily, and something which hasn't been in touch on the first page, you also get really an outreach to experts with the community. But... Uh, yeah, even if you don't want to make use on your own, you may also work with a consultancy, you don't make a, use a vendor to provide software, so it's also a service idea which you have. And if you now think, how much part of my work is really uh, relying and consuming open source, and I guess there's many, many components which you may use of, and if you then say, in a mobility environment or an automotive environment, to how much of this do I really contribute back? So where will I give back something to the community of the software, of the hardware which I consume? And typically the answer is mostly just a little bit li limited number or nothing at all. And then the next thing would be, well, you built this product. 
and you have competitors. And you consume open source, most likely your competitor will also consume open source. But how much do you know from your competitor which software components are in there? Especially if you're a very closed environment where you see a competitor. So most likely you will know nothing. And there's no traditionally, like, no real collaboration. Nothing is in there. You don't know what the product of the other company looks like. And um, interesting enough, 20 years back, when I was not yet in Bosch, but my joint venture company where I worked in was founded. This was a joint venture created by Bosch and Denso. And it was really in 2003, uh, where they said, well, uh, we need to be more competitive. We need to build, and this time it was navigation and radio devices. And what they said, we are the two largest companies in the world, the biggest competitors, but we joined forces in a joint venture to create and concentrate on non-differentiating elements of the software stack and the hardware. And they started with building an ASIC because hardware was the most expensive part of it and they saw they could have the most savings with it. And then they figured out the hardware needs software. So they moved on and added the software. They created a software group. They figured out that even the data format for navigation is not something which is differentiating because you need to have a standard format all around the world. So they were also bringing this together. And then we start in this joint venture, ASIC environment, very closed, still already a bit open, right? This was the joint venture was like the collaboration of the past. And interesting enough was it started with an ASIC, but they saw that the ASIC costs are very high. And to lower the cost again, they said, let's make a standard product. So the next generation of hardware was in collaboration with the silicon vendor, which was selling this chip, which was created by Bosch and Denso, also to the open for a standard commercial product. And then in the next generation, it moved on and we said, that doesn't make sense anymore to even spend this money. So we just bought a chip a commercial off the shelf and say, we do not develop it anymore, it's too expensive. And during this transition, even between the first standard product and the um, commercial off the shelf, we figured out that why should we always take a commercial OS, develop all these drivers if there is a large ecosystem? And so in 2012 time or so, we brought our first Linux product into the field just for a cost-saving reason. And I guess this is one of the main driver still in the mobility to really look for where can I save cost, but not really taking all the risks in there or seeing the risks because normally you end up with just saying, I want to be faster, I can use it and it makes cheap because I save some royalties or something like this. But there are elements like that you are new to the market and you don't know about the licenses yet. There are, I would say, positive and negative license impacts which you can have. And what you also go, you go maybe to a silicon vendor and you get software provided by someone and you just take it and say, well, they deliver the software, it's for free, I can start developing something on it. But you may end up in a trap because this is just software to bring up something. It's not a quality software, it's nothing which you really considered for a long time. So this is the next step that you need to understand, I need to maintain something. And if we are in automotive or mobility, we will talk about 20 years plus maintenance. So we have product in the life cycle which need to be maintained 20 years. And if you look into civil infrastructure environments, you may end up with 30 years plus, right? And if you don't see this, things get connected. I don't know if any one of you owns a connected washing machine, for example, which can be controlled by apps. Uh, Consider how long you use your washing machine. I personally, I guess I have my one since 15 years. It's not connected definitely, but it's running smoothly for 15 years. And if I have a connected one, maybe in 15 years, I still want to see that the connectivity works and nobody hacks the washing machine to set up the temperature always to 90 degrees and shrinking all my clothes. <laughs> well, and also for a car, you may not change your car that often. There are people who change their cars every two years. Maybe you change your phone every two years, but typically, also here, I see many people running cars for 10, 15 years. Things may change here due to more a sharing environment, more for 
distributed autonomous driving gave you a new trend on this, so this may all change, but still there is a lot of equipment around there which is in use for many, many years, where you might not have full access, but things get connected. So this is something else which is a risk factor, which means consider what you take when you do open source. And the highest risk maybe is local modifications. Because if your car is not, or your device is not connected, if you don't do that much, but you have just plain things, then all may be good. But what will end up is you download something and it gives you just the 80% fit, 90% fit. But you will most likely modify something in there. And this can cause breaking changes. And I guess I have somewhere later also some examples. This is what happened to us with these kind of uh, unconsidered dependencies. So I come back to this later, right? Uh, yeah, one element to find out what you have in the system, and I need to mention it these days, so it's the S-bomb. Uh, it's your ingredients of the product, and you need to understand really how things look like. And what I found interesting about this was, I was talking to the uh, people from Ozadl, like some years back, and they do a lot with small and middle-sized enterprises, and they said they really have consulted companies which brought in industrial Linux products into the market by just downloading the things, getting things to work and ship it. They never considered which kind of license they have in. They never did a check. They never published the code later on which they had to publish from the GPL license perspective. So they were completely blank and never knew what's in there. So that's why I also put this specific part, and I believe it's good that we stand up with the S-bomb part to know what's in there, to figure out where are vulnerabilities. And uh, here I also put the icon of the SPDX in there. There's also a Cyclone DX as an alternative, but I guess currently the SPDX is moving fast, getting new elements in there. Um, I'm also active in the ELISA project, which is for enabling Linux and safety applications. And this brought for example, new elements for requirements management also into the SBOM for design documents, SPDX for safety, because if we are thinking about a mobility industry where you do more autonomous function, assistance functions, you always get safety involved and you have many suppliers in there. So that's what we have here. And yeah, another one about the license. So if you have a wrong license, this can also slow you down or may have a major impact on your community. So what you can see, if you have a very permissive license and you're not considering good community management, um, then you see that your product may not grow that much. So what I come from the past, I knew free artists, free artists shipped by many uh, SOC vendors also as an artist, and it doesn't bring any, yeah, real obligations due to the very permissive license in there, but you hardly find a community. And it's growing, and I guess what you see from a community is just the tip of the iceberg because so much is done in-house and just like kept locally. While if you take, for example, the Zephyr project where it's really a lot of stress is put on community, put to the open, you can see there it's growing uh, contributor, there's growing committers, and so this is something where you can have the element on the other side, you can say there's also a very copyleft license. And if you are in a mobility environment like we am, or I would say automotive, when we built infotainment system, we had hard pains to get rid of all the GPL v3 versions. And even if a software changes over time and change the license, we need to see how we handle things. It's not that we don't want to open certain topics, but we have obligations. If you are working with strong partners like um, Google and Apple, and you need to have CarPlay and Android Auto in your car to sell this these days, you need to make sure that all the licenses are properly handled and that you're not unreal any information. So therefore, handling the license is very important. And when we did this, we were quite young in the company. So therefore, uh, I would say these days you need to master the technology in the companies. You see it with manufacturing, car manufacturers, which really try to do more responsibility on the system, on open source. and uh, what we did in the beginning, we took open source consultancies. The first problem which we challenged was the, the company which we had in. They haven't considered how much quality and effort it takes in mobility or automotive. Thank, thanks a lot. Those questions. Questions? Hi, my name is Lonneke Driessen and I work for the Open Charge Alliance. So we develop OSPP. 
I have a sincere question, something that I don't, do not understand, and I'm happy that you're here so I can ask the question. So you obviously work for the Linux Foundation and for Robotpos. And the work that your company allows you to do is in open source, yes. which is great. Uh, today and the next few days are about EV charging. Pionix and Everest and OCA were about EV charging. And I know that Robert Boss currently is actively litigating their patents in EV charging. So my question to you is, what makes a company such as Robert Boss decide that in one area you are fully on board with open source and in other areas you opt for IP and getting getting revenue from that. So what, what triggers you go one way or the other? <laughs> That's a very good question. First of all, um, we have 400,000 employees inside Bosch. So we have different fields and we are the largest patent provider in Germany. So I guess we have the most patent applications still in Germany. And Bosch is a company which makes money and does this also with patents, so there is a lot. What I found recently, and that's why I like this question a lot, we have discussions with an open source partner. And they were telling us for years, why do you need patents? Patents are nothing, you don't need any aid. You teach two topics in the open. They came up with a very great idea, and they now ask us to sign an NDA and they will only make business with us if we no longer talk with the competitor because they have the concern that the competitor may go somewhere else. This is one thing to be seen that even if you are in an open environment and if you see something very great, you may end up with patents. That the one part, and they don't use patents, but they did never filed a patent, they had developed the technology and now they see if we open this, there is a partner which is much stronger. And the other element was, I was sitting at lunch and I had to hear, like for 20 minutes, listen to a guy who was really aggressively telling me that this thing about G we remove GPLv3 is a bad thing because it's totally permissive. And I never asked which company this guy is in. And afterwards I figured out, well, that company is really doing commercial licensing and sell and earning their money with their commercial, they have GPLv3 and they have the same component as a commercial component. So they do it that, not that you can use it, but you cannot use it commercially. And I found this very interesting because this person also told me all the time, I need to be very permissive. And it's definitely a conflict and it's also not that open source is spread everywhere in Bosch and it's also not that patents are seen overall. But uh, yeah, you make a valid point on this. Yeah, but I would, I'm just trying to, maybe you don't know, but what is the mechanism? Because if we know what decides them to go either way or the other way, we can maybe convince them that in EV charging it's maybe better if they go the open source way. Yeah, I, I believe it's a lot of education and making awareness and explaining the things. Because the IP people, so whenever I make a contribution, I have to talk to people who are responsible for intellectual property. So it's for every commit, for every new project where I do something, I go through a checklist, it's like different shading technologies, the list is very long, and we need to do education. We need to educate where the things are. So we're on a path, and I get time, as you say, to work in open source. I am a member of the Linux Foundation Advisory Board. I'm a promoter of open, but I also have to convince a lot of management, which was growing up in an environment where you just make money with your patterns and where you protect yourself with patterns and that's something where we work on but we still also see sometimes there's a good way to have still a pattern to just earn a whole lot of money with it. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Nope. There's one over there. One final maybe before we move on. Kind of a follow-up to a longest question. Uh, there is a this thing called the Open Invention Network. Uh, where companies commit their patent into a defensive pool uh, to, uh, to, defend, to defend the industry against patent trolls. Uh, would something like that uh, also work uh, to protect the uh, mobility and EV charging industry? From a Linux Foundation Europe perspective and seeing the members which are in there, I see that 
a way to go to protect certain things. But um, oh, we had the slide on the NDA and very closed environment. Um, when I was first read about it, I, I found it great. I found it very good, but I'm a person who never went into intellectual property because of my 15 years with the joint venture, right? We were not supposed to create any kind of IP because we always work in commodity. And then I heard about it, oh, that's great. This gives a lot of opportunities. But then we are where I have been before. I, you need to convince people to bring this forward. For example, bring a Bosch in to give the patents away. If you are the major player and if you are the one which holds the most patents, do you strongly have the feeling uh, will I give more than I get? And if my pile and stack of patents is very high, I need to see if I really go into it or not. So this is something where I, I would say from a Linux Foundation perspective, yes. From open source perspective, yes. From the size of company, in Bosch I have hard times to explain and bring it forward. And we could also take a chat later <laughs> definitely on this. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? No? And thanks, Philip. Thanks. Um, yeah.